tonight, an 86-year-old man taken to hospital in police custody after the body of his 78-year-old partner was discovered at a home in Gordon. Also tonight, former Treasurer Josh Frydenberg considers running in his old seat of Kuyong, where the Liberal Party has already pre-selected a young woman. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu rejects growing calls from the families of hostages to accept a proposed ceasefire. And Jordan Rapana nails two field goals for the Raiders to win a Golden Point thriller over the Dolphins. Yuma, good evening. Alice Matthews with ABC News, coming to you from Ngunnawal country. And we also acknowledge other people and families with connection to the lands of the ACT. An 86-year-old man is tonight in custody after police discovered the body of his 78-year-old wife, Wanda Dorothy Yule, at her home in Gordon. The cause of the woman's death is yet to be confirmed and no charges have been laid but police say they're treating it as a suspected family violence incident. Police erected screens around the Togo Place unit, leaving neighbours wondering what went wrong. We have a lot of like elderly in this area. It's usually quite quiet, apart from all of like the dogs on the strip, but usually nothing happens around here. It was reports of a disturbance that prompted police to conduct a welfare check just after 7am. Unfortunately, soon after arrival, police located a uh, a 78-year-old female uh, deceased at the location. Detectives say they arrested her husband, 86-year-old Manfred Yule, at a property in Fatten a short time afterwards. He's currently in Canberra Hospital undergoing medical assessment uh, for a possible cardiac episode. Police are yet to lay charges, but they don't suspect anyone else was involved. All I'd say is for people is to, you know, look out for your friends and family. If you think there are issues with mental or physical health, uh, particularly as people get into their elder years, that they, they reach out and talk to somebody, get the assistance they need. A post-mortem is scheduled for next week to determine cause of death. Meanwhile, police are urging anyone with information to come forward. Harry Frost, ABC News, Canberra. If this story has raised issues for you or anyone you know, you can call 1800 RESPECT on 1800 737 732. And you can now also text for help on 0458 737 732. The federal government says it is using drones to track where former immigration detainees are living. There's been confusion after the immigration minister first revealed their use as part of a monitoring program that also includes electronic bracelets. After a week-long immigration migraine, the federal government is clarifying how it's using drones to track former immigration detainees released after the High Court last year ruled indefinite immigration detention was unlawful. More in the sense of monitoring the accommodation that people are living in and, for example, ensuring uh, that it's not too close to schools or other areas that they're not supposed to be living close yeah, you like could, that. You could use Google Maps to find out whether someone's house is too close to a school. Are drones seriously being used for this? That's my understanding, uh, David, is, is, to, is to monitor the location and the accommodation of these offenders. Facing questions about how closely the former detainees are being watched, given a man allegedly involved in violently attacking a Perth couple wasn't wearing an ankle monitor, the under pressure immigration minister this week insisted the group is closely monitored. Things like using drones to keep track of these people. But a day later, federal police, part of a joint operation set up to manage the former detainees, said... In terms of compliance and monitoring, that's a rule for ABF, but I've got no knowledge of, of drones being used. What on earth is going on here and why wouldn't Andrew Giles be upfront about whether or not he just made this up or he accidentally revealed a secret drone program? The Home Affairs Department says it may use aerial imagery from a variety of sources for operational planning purposes, like to confirm the location of a visa holder's accommodation. As for whether criminals who are foreign nationals should be deported, even if they've spent the majority of their life in Australia, the government says a new direction will make it crystal clear to officials that community safety should be their top priority. Meanwhile, the government has cancelled around 20 visas that were reinstated upon appeal under the existing direction. Evelyn Manfield, ABC News, Canberra. 
Senior Liberal Karen Andrews has thrown her support behind a possible return to federal politics for Josh Frydenberg, saying he's needed back in the party. The ABC understands the former Treasurer is considering throwing his hat back in the ring for his old seat of Kooyong, following an electoral redistribution in Victoria. But that would be at the expense of the female candidate the party has already pre-selected. Could this be the Liberals' new comeback king? Three decades after John Howard uttered that famous line about returning to the leadership... Oh, that's Lazarus with a triple bypass. I mean... <laughs> Josh Frydenberg is weighing up the options of his own Lazarus-like return from the political scrap heap. I'm not necessarily uh, of his persuasion politically, but I think he's a, th a thoroughly decent man. He's uh, such a, a statesman, so intelligent. Mr Frydenberg's renewed interest comes after the Electoral Commission proposed new boundaries in Victoria, with the seat of Higgins being abolished and Kooyong expanded to take in affluent suburbs such as Turak. Mr Frydenberg has the backing of senior Liberal Karen Andrews, who told the ABC, we need to have the strongest political offering possible in Victoria and Josh Frydenberg and his experience is it. But it's not that simple. The Liberal Party has already pre-selected its candidate for Kooyong. 31-year-old former finance professional Amelia Hamer got the nod earlier this year. Replacing her with Mr Frydenberg would not only prove difficult, it would also reflect badly on a party struggling with women's representation. They still have a problem with, with women and representation of women and the whole issue around women. It will be a very, very bad look. Former Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett is firmly behind Ms Hamer. If he wants to stand, then stand in a seat that we can win, uh, preferably from the Labor Party. Amelia Hamer wasn't buying into the discussion, tweeting only that here in Kooyong, the community loves to support strong women. The change in Kooyong's voter base since the last election may not play so well for the former MP. While there have been more than 24,000 new enrolments, all but 800 of those are within the new boundaries, and around 60% are aged under 39. So the electorate is becoming younger and more, di and, and more diverse uh, and it's going to be a lot more difficult in, at the, um, in 2025. Sasha Payne, ABC News, Melbourne. People who share deep fake pornography online will face years behind bars as part of legislation being introduced into federal parliament this week. The government says pornographic images generated by artificial intelligence overwhelmingly affect women. And this is part of broader efforts to address men's violence against women. Under the new legislation, sharing non-consensual, sexually explicit deepfake material will carry a penalty of six years in jail. And someone who creates the deepfake without consent will face a higher penalty of seven years in prison. Israel's Prime Minister has labelled a proposal to bring about a total ceasefire in Gaza a non-starter. Less than 24 hours after US President Joe Biden unveiled the plan, which he says was drawn up by Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu appears to have rubbished the proposal. It's only added to the anger within Israel, with tens of thousands taking to the streets, calling for the hostages to be brought home. <laughs> Fire and fury spilling over on the streets of Tel Aviv. Organisers say 120,000 people turned out in the largest day of protest since the October 7 attacks. The demands from the masses here are simple. They want a deal to bring the hostages home. But they say their Prime Minister won't do it. Yesterday, Biden gave us, the families, a little bit of hope that was uh, missing for us uh, a lot of days. That hope was a three-stage proposal that could end the war presented by US President Joe Biden. He says it was drawn up by Israel, with Western leaders quick to offer their backing. One of the best things about the, the potential of this deal is that we'd not only be able to get the hostages out, but we'd be able to flood Gaza with aid. But less than 24 hours after Biden unveiled the plan, a statement from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu labelled the proposal a non-starter without the complete destruction of Hamas, saying Israel's conditions for ending the war have not changed. 
It's unclear to what extent Benjamin Netanyahu was aware of or even involved in the US plan and whether Joe Biden is trying to strong arm Israel into ending the war before the US elections. Hamas says it's willing to negotiate but the biggest disagreement remains the complete withdrawal of Israeli troops. And Netanyahu's far-right coalition partners have threatened to quit and bring down the government should this deal go ahead, further narrowing the likelihood of a truce. In Rafah, where more than a million Palestinians had previously fled, Israel's invasion continues to deepen. Fresh strikes killed dozens of civilians last week, with the toll and suffering here growing by the day. Alison Horn, ABC News, Jerusalem. Australian healthcare workers who have been in Gaza treating the wounded have returned home with harrowing first-hand accounts. The World Health Organisation says about half a million people in the area have no functional accessible hospitals. Gazan health authorities say more than 36,000 Palestinians, almost 14,000 of them children, have been killed since October 7. Israel says around 1,200 Israelis were killed in the Hamas attack that day. And a warning, details and images in this story are graphic and distressing. Chantal Al-Khoury reports. I need to do an operation on her, OK? After two weeks stationed at one of the last hospitals left in Gaza, this Sydney surgeon is still coming to terms with what he witnessed. I went thinking, oh, when I come back I'm going to be perfectly fine. But it's actually taken a lot to get over. You don't, you can't get past these memories. Dr Adesamili says many patients at Al-Aqsa Hospital were dying in terrible pain. We would be doing these horrific surgeries where you've amputated legs and explored people's abdomen and opened their chests, yet they don't have adequate analgesia to be able to cope with afterwards and they'd be on simple Panadol. So it was heartbreaking seeing them in agony. And he can still hear the sound of parents wailing after losing their children. I don't think there was a day that went by that I didn't see children dying. Um, a lot of these children, I've got countless children's names in my head that I cannot even forget. But the trauma he saw was more than just physical. Dr Scarlett Wong supported thousands of unaccompanied children in Gaza, now made orphans. The first trauma is that they're under bombardment and they're being killed and they're seeing their family and loved one killed by bombs and by quadcopters. That is the first trauma. The second trauma is that nobody's doing anything about it, that they now know that the whole world knows and yet no one is stopping it. For Dr Moder al Beiruti, the horrors have become hard to describe. Given the, the nature of those blast injuries, most people will be dead on arrival. Um, the others will be with devastating injuries that we in medicine call non-survivable injuries. There's certain types of trauma therapies where you actually need, you know, your limbs to be able to do that therapy. It involves like hugging yourself and there are lots of children out there who can't even do that therapy and that was really challenging to think about because they literally have no way to comfort themselves. On Friday, the IDF said more than 250 humanitarian aid trucks were transferred into Gaza, but the UN warns the amount of aid entering has dropped by 70% since Israel began its operation in Rafah and at least 500 trucks a day are needed. It's unfathomable to think that there's children dying of starvation two kilometres away with all this food that's rotting just outside and we're letting this happen. So you can see um, all these aid trucks for kilometres. All three doctors say they saw hundreds of trucks carrying food and medicine at a standstill on the Egyptian side of the border. At least let them die when they're with a full stomach rather than die when they're hungry. Now home, the doctors are on another mission to share their experiences. Gaza at the moment is hell on earth. What the children of Gaza need is for humanity to prevail. And for that to happen, we need a ceasefire. Despite all the pain, they have the desire to live. 
and you'll feel that there. A mission they're hoping they won't face alone. Chantelle Alcouri, ABC News, Sydney. Almost 10 days since a landslide swallows, swallowed homes in Papua New Guinea's highlands, villagers are still digging through piles of rubble, searching for the bodies of their loved ones. The death toll from the catastrophe still isn't clear and there are fears the search could trigger a fresh landslip, making the recovery even harder. Our correspondent Marion Farr is in Mulitaka in Enga province, the area hardest hit. Still in mourning, nine days after disaster struck. But before the disaster, a warning. We came out of our houses and were calling others to wake up. Most people were still asleep. Survivors in Mulitaka have told the ABC they remember hearing two large cracks around 1am and 2am. Only an hour later, the mountain collapsed. For those of us who heard the sound, we were able to escape, but the ones who didn't hear were buried in their sleep. Almost a week and a half on, only a handful of bodies have been recovered, but there are fears hundreds could still be buried. Wende Wambluk Jr. survived, but lost five relatives, including his young daughter. Four bodies were recovered, but my child remains buried. I am exhausted and I am resting today. Tomorrow I will continue to dig with a crowbar and spade. Digging for bodies using sticks and shovels seems like an impossible task amid the masses of rock and rubble, but people are still determined to find their loved ones. Australia is shipping in aid and essential supplies. Officials are warning that sending in excavators could trigger another landslide. A team of Australian disaster response experts are using drones to map the site to determine how large that risk is. Once the authorities here have that information, they'll be able to make some firm decisions about how they manage the site. While villagers who have lost everything face a long and painful road ahead. One block around, stop. My concern is finding new land where I can resettle my family. When you have land, you can build a home. Right now, that home and so much else lies buried. Marion Farr, ABC News, Mulitaka. Coming back home now and people have travelled to Canberra from across Australia this weekend for a cash swapping exhibition with the Royal Mint. It's the first event of its kind since before the COVID-19 pandemic and attendance numbers showed coin collecting continues to be a popular hobby. If anything, the decline in the use of cash to pay for goods has only heightened the enthusiasm of many coin collectors. So today I bought a $110 pack. I bought an $80 pack and I bought another $100 pack. For Kelly, coin collecting started with her great-grandparents and has become a lifelong hobby. And they got Australian pennies when they came here from Germany. We got our, from the 1800s, our very first penny. For coin collectors, also known as numismatists, age is no barrier. My daughter, she's just 11 years old, but uh, she knows all the names and the history as well. I like, um, like the one with the, like, the king's face on it or maybe the red poppy. This weekend was the Royal Australian Mint's coin swap, an opportunity to get coins straight from the source in mint condition. And with this being the first time the event has been run since before the COVID-19 pandemic, there was plenty of pent-up demand. There's a thousand dollars worth of coins here that includes coins that enthusiasts have travelled across the country to collect. For many, it's a historical value that's most prized. It certainly is an opportunity for people to grab a memento of an event that they might really even be able to get to themselves. So it's that connecting Australia through the stories that we can tell on coins. Coins featuring King Charles, the 75th anniversary of World War II and firefighters are particularly prized. That is a very special coin, not only for me, but for entire Australia. This is a coin that was dedicated for firefighters, especially after the devastating bushfires we had. For numismatists, the pursuit of the rarest coins makes perfect sense. Justina Basta, 
ABC News, Canberra. Until a few decades ago, you couldn't sit outside a cafe in Canberra without swarms of flies descending on your meal. Happily, that's all changed, thanks to the humble dung beetle. These insects also help enrich the soil, and farmers in the Canberra region are being encouraged to introduce more of them. ABC cameraman Simon Beardsell met two of the scientists leading the charge. Each one of those cows drops around 12 cow pads a day and each cow pad averages about one and a half kilograms of uh, dung. So in total, each day we have close to half a million tonnes of cow dung being dropped on the continent each day. There's certainly some species of dung beetle in this and uh, that's Taurus. The bigger one's Taurus. Dung beetles are a pretty important tool for being able to improve soil biology and soil health. They take the dung, create tunnels and take the dung down underground. So you, you're building up nutrients, you're, you're building air porosity, you're also um, allowing water to be able to penetrate um, into the soil. The uh, small fawn coloured beetle is called fulvus. It comes from France and Spain. The soil filters out all the nasty chemicals and we end up with much cleaner, clearer water in the creeks, rivers, estuaries and oceans. In fact, in my opinion, there is nothing that water catchment authorities could do that would be more efficient than supporting dung beetle releases in their water catchment areas. I think um, the more more farmers know about it and they're aware of the, um, the great value of the dung beetles, um, the more they come on board. It really only takes a, you know, a handful of farmers in each district in the ACT for, for the beetles to be able to build up their numbers. They're very competitive. They will steal dung from another species or another pair of beetles of the same species. I can walk around some cattle properties where there are thousands of head of cattle. There are no bush flies in the summer months, no <coughs> buffalo fly and no dung in the paddocks. So after 50 years of working with dung beetles, it's a very satisfying experience. To sport now, and just a week after being axed from the New South Wales side, James Tedesco has now joined the Blues camp and will play in Wednesday night's Origin opener. It comes after scans this morning confirmed Dylan Edwards suffered a quad strain, cruelly ending his dream debut. The Panthers' fullback had waited years to wear blue. But now Dylan Edwards will have to wait even longer. Scans confirming the 28-year-old had suffered a quad strain after pulling up sore from Saturday's training session, prompting coach Michael Maguire to call incumbent fullback James Tedesco. Obviously great news for, for Teddy, not for Dylan. You know, it's disappointing. Uh, when those things happen, but, um, uh, you know, fortunate uh, for Teddy to keep playing and I know he, uh, he's really keen. The Roosters were expecting their captain to face the Cowboys. Instead, he'll extend his record to 23 straight games for New South Wales. Yeah, obviously a bit different him going back into camp, um, but man, happy for him. He deserves to be there and I'm looking forward to him playing next Wednesday. 11 players watched on from Origin Camps this afternoon as the Cowboys produced a comeback thriller. Down 14 to 4 at the break, North Queensland were then down to 12 men, but still managed to fight back and produce a third straight win. Drinkwater. Here he is, taking them on. He'll score. Last night, a golden point thriller at Redcliffe as Jordan Rapiner proved a hero for the Raiders. That might have got a touch. But it wasn't without controversy. Did he get a little flick on that, uh, Marshall King? So Levi getting in his way. The Dolphins fuming because just minutes before they were denied the chance to win the game for that exact reason. Penalty. Blockers. Max Clough changes his line. 
Wayne Bennett slammed the refereeing post-match. We'll have to wait on Monday to blame Amos. He gives his report about all the mistakes they made. Nothing's going to change, I accept that. But um, I suppose my players need some answers. Tonight, you know, we'll, we'll be a team for 80 minutes. We shouldn't, shouldn't have even had to go into Golden Point. Jessica Stewart, ABC News. The Brumbies have sealed third spot in Super Rugby Pacific after a tight win over Western Force. The Brumbies started strong with two early tries in Perth last night, but the Force didn't make it easy, scoring late to narrow the gap to five points. The Brumbies went on to win 24 points to 19. They'll host the Highlanders at Canberra Stadium for the quarterfinals next week. In tennis, Australia's Alex Simonor has set up a French Open showdown with Russia's Daniil Medvedev after he advanced to the fourth round at Roland Garros for the first time. The world number 11 fought back from a set down to beat Germany's Jan Leonard Struff in four sets. In the miserable conditions, Simonor says there was one fan that gave him the lift he needed. Vying to be the first Australian man to reach the final 16 since Leighton Hewitt, Alex Dimonor was on the back foot early against his big hitting opponent. What a start from Struff. Jan Leonard Struff took the opening set, but the fleet footed demon hit back. <laughs> Surely not. Oh, it's incredible what he gets back. Rain set in on another grey Paris morning, forcing play to stop. When the contest resumed almost five hours later, Dimonor went to another level. Dimonor prevailed in four sets. And there was one fan in particular he wanted to thank for sticking by him in the wet and cold. Yeah, that kid, after every single point, uh, was yelling, was getting me up, getting me going. Uh, every time I changed ends, I was locking eyes with him and uh, it was an extremely special uh, moment. The 25-year-old will next face Russian star Daniel Medvedev. Dimonor is the last Australian left in the singles draw after a third straight five-set match proved one too many for Thanasi Kokonakis. An exhausted Kokonakis was two sets down to American Taylor Fritz when he challenged a line call. If you don't find that mark, I'm going to lose that year. His protest worked and he won the next two sets. But Fritz recovered to claim the decider and send the South Australian home. Tom Maddox, ABC News. To the weather now, and thank you to Ian McKinnon, who's been out and about exploring the new walking trails at Gin and Derry and snapped this photo of Shepherd's Lookout and the Murrumbidgee River. Two days into winter, and we had a low of four degrees overnight before reaching a top of 14 today. Further afield, Threadbow Top Station recorded nearly a mil of rain with a low of minus six and didn't get above zero. Along the coast, Ulladulla got to 17 degrees today and Maruya slightly warmer at 18. Across the country, a shower or two in Perth and 20 degrees, partly cloudy in Melbourne and Hobart, sunny in Adelaide and Brisbane, 32 in Darwin. The satellite is showing an offshore low with cloud with a trough spreading across east co the east coast is bringing showers to parts of New South Wales and Victoria and gusty showers from clouds with vigorous cold front over WA. On the synoptic, unstable southerly winds bringing isolated storms to inland New South Wales. Cloud over SA New South Wales, Victoria and Tasmania in cold southerly winds is also bringing showers cloud over WA ahead of a cold front is bringing isolated showers and storms. Tomorrow some cloud cover in Adelaide, rain and 14 in Hobart, sunny in Sydney with a top of 19. Around our region tomorrow in the Yass Valley a top of 12 and a chance of a shower in Cooma. There's a sheep graziers warning for the snowy mountains and south coast and a marine gale warning for the Illawarra, Batemans Bay and Eden coastlines. Tomorrow, Canberra can expect to start the week with a partly cloudy day and a top of 13. The sun will rise at 7am and set at 5.03. Looking ahead, morning frost and a low of zero for Tuesday, a top of 15 on Wednesday, 15 again on Thursday with showers this time. Partly cloudy and 16 on Friday, also raining. The rain will ease off on Saturday though with the sun peaking out and a top of 17. And that is the latest from the Canberra Newsroom. I'm Alice Matthews. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much for your company, Yarra, and good night.